So far, we've decoded the science behind the usage of industrial sand. Then, environmentally, we looked at the impact on air quality and the technology they use to control. But look at all this water they're using. That's got to be impacting that part of the environment. All right, critical question. Get your environmental ears on. Uh, you know, water, the key to all life. You guys on the trail of all that water? Yeah, we are. And just like the water cycle in nature, this place kind of has its own water cycle. First, it's got to come from somewhere. And the wells look pretty huge, too. No tell them how they affect the aquifer. You know, the ground water supply below the ground that we can't see. Time to find out. Just like nature has a water cycle, we have our own water cycle here. And it starts with this pump. What you can't see here is this well goes down into the aquifer, and that's where our water cycle starts. Before any water was pulled out of the aquifer, there was a hydrological study done. And we have three of these wells placed over three and a half miles apart to minimize the impact on the aquifer. We also have monitoring wells, and that's important because we need to know if we're having an impact on that aquifer. So what are the results really showing you? They're showing us that we don't have a sustained impact on the aquifer. So we only need to run these pumps maybe every two or three months because we recycle the majority of our water here. We're only pumping 150 gallons a minute, but the plant uses 15,000 gallons a minute. And we're able to do that because we can recycle our water. Although that building doesn't look like much, it filters 99% of our water. And it does it by using thickeners, filter presses, and vacuum belts. So what are we gonna see in that building? Well, one really cool thing you're gonna see in that building is a vacuum belt. And so you're gonna see a wet sand and water mix on one side, and by the time it gets to the end of the belt, it'll be dry. So it allows the water to come through, but it keeps the sand on top. So what are those thickeners? Thickeners allow all the clays and sediment in that water to drop out, and it thickens it into more of a mud. From there, that mud will get pumped in to what we call filter presses. And those work by compacting that mud in between cloths at a really high pressure, and the water is able to leak out. And when you're done, you have a cake. It takes all the mud and slime out of the water, makes it pure again, so we can pump it back to our process. So you protect the groundwater, that's cool. Well, what about the surface water? I see erosion right over there. Yeah, fess up. Well, none of that leaves the site. This site is internally draining. So all that water and erosion you were worried about in the mine site, that's all collected. And it leaves that area, but it ends up back here. This is the end point. This is where we allow it to seep back in. So this is the surface water, the rainwater we catch. When this seeps back in, it's cleaned by the rocks. So we're actually recharging part of the aquifer with the storm water that we collect. We already know from other investigations that the sustainability of something needs to conclude the three R's. Reduce, reuse, and recycle. And by the looks of their water cycle, they checked all three R's in that mining operation. Now for the biggie. They have to be impacting the landscape with all that land they're tearing up. No way around it. If you dug out all the sand in your sandbox, you'd have a big hole. So when they're done with this place, there's going to be a really huge hole, right? Wrong. They can't do that, can they? Hey, guys, ask them why they're trying to conceal their mine in a hole. So as you can tell, mining and reclamation happen continuously. You mine and then fill topsoil and reclaim with vegetation. But why is it in a hole? Yeah, got something to hide? Well, it is kind of in a hole, and yeah, we are hiding it, but in a good way. This is a rural community, and we wanted to maintain the rural landscape. Well, before we even start mining on the site, we do wildlife and habitat surveys to understand what's here, and once we understand what's here, we work the understanding of those species into our reclamation plan. 
It's reviewed by local, state agencies, and even the public before we can even start mining. It only looks like a lot of weeds on a hill, right? But Jamie explained that what you can't see is the first step of reshaping the landscape. They use sophisticated computer programs, along with GPS autopilots in their bulldozers, to reshape the land into natural hills and contours. Then it's time to plant. We come through and plant grasses to establish the soils to prevent erosion. And a few years later, once the grasses are established, we come back in and plant trees. So eventually, after 10 to 20 years, we'll have a pine oak barren similar to what was here before we started mining. And you end up not being able to tell what's been mined and what hasn't. But even with the restoration program, there's still a lot of unanswered questions about the impacts on the other parts of the ecosystem. Yeah, like, what about the wildlife? Hey, consider this. <laughs> Next, we finally zero in on the impacts of the living parts of the ecosystems and nearby communities. Oh yeah.